Hello, it's Scott Manley here. About 18 months ago, I revealed details of a stealth rocket startup called Astra. They were building rockets in the middle of the San Francisco Bay Area. In a part of the world surrounded by internet tech companies, they were building a small sat launch vehicle in the old Alameda Navy base. If all goes well, they should be making their first launch to orbit very soon as part of something called the DARPA Rapid Launch Challenge. So the DARPA Launch Challenge aims to develop rapid response launch capability. The task is to launch a spacecraft given just a few weeks of notice, instead of given the years typically associated with their launch plans. That would net the team a prize of $2 million, but that's not the end of things. Assuming this works, they would then have the chance to perform a second launch from another site within days. And that will net them a cool $10 million. Now, originally the plan was they would have two different launch sites in two different parts of the world, but now it looks like both launch sites will be at the Kodiak missile range, albeit about 300 meters apart. The key thing was the launch vehicles weren't supposed to require a dedicated pad. Originally, there were three finalists who were announced, and they were Vector Space Systems, Virgin Orbit, and an unnamed third team, but of course the smart people out there speculated that it was Astra, and that was quickly confirmed by other teams involved. Since then, Virgin Orbit withdrew, Vector has gone bankrupt, leaving Astra as the only competitor. Now, when this happened, Astra was still secret, but at the start of February, they finally went public. They were a major sponsor at the Small Sat Symposium uh, conference in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. And, you know, that was their market. They want to sell to Small Sat builders. So they bust a lot of people up to their factory, had the party, gave them some food, and tried to sell them on their rocket. Which, as far as we can tell, doesn't actually have a name. It's just the rocket. Uh, it's like a 12 meter tall launcher. It uses five engines that are using electrically driven pumps. According to the video, they generate a total of 140 kilonewtons. So that would be 28 kilonewtons. For comparison, the um, Rocket Lab's Electron, those Rutherford engines generate 24 kilonewtons. When I did my video about 18 months ago, they talked about like 40 kilonewtons of thrust. So this is a bit of a step down, but it should be more than enough to lift their launch vehicle. Also in my previous video, I'd looked at various filings for grants that they had and suggested that they might be considering using uh, differential throttle to steer the rocket. And this would have been a really cool innovation. However, it, they're definitely not doing that. It's very clear that they have actuators on these rockets that they are able to gimbal the motors. Uh, if you look at the pictures, then they are actually they have the, like heat resistant fabric around the rocket nozzles, allowing them to move and therefore control and steer the rocket. I'm not sure about the second stage at this time. It would seem logical to presume that it's just a copy of the first stage engines, but with a vacuum optimized nozzle. The structure is all aluminium. It looks like the first stage has a common bulkhead. It runs on kerosene and liquid oxygen. The fairing at the top has a cork coating on it. And the whole thing fits inside a shipping container, which is you know, really interesting because you see the shipping container being unloaded from a plane. And then later, you see the team, on another video, you see the team performing payload integration inside this container. So it's like almost set up like a payload integration facility. The payloads on this test launch are three small CubeSats, one called Prometheus, one called Archie, and the other called Soars. And when I saw those written down, I had a terrible, terrible interpretation. But yeah, those are going to be their payloads. As I said, there's no permanent launch pad. There's a launch structure you can see with flame diverters and ignition hardware. There's various carts for loading fuel onto it and uh, support structures that are all mobile. The launch was originally planned for Tuesday, but it looks like weather has pushed it out to the Thursday at the earliest. While the rocket design doesn't have a name beyond Astra 3.0, this specific vehicle is called One of Three. The justification being that they think there's a one in three chance of it being successful, or rather that it usually takes three launches to get this thing going. 
And I'm presuming the one of three implies that that doesn't include the previous two launches they attempted from Kodiak under great secrecy. It was known that both of these launches were intended to be suborbital launches testing the first stage with a dummy payload, but both of them failed even before they could leave the facility. I've heard that the first launch failed after a fire started in the engine bay and it essentially burned through all the wiring to their pumps and the vehicle fell back to earth. The second one, there were a pair of engine failures and then it shut them all off and again, it fell back to earth. What I do know for sure is that they both fell within the confines of the launch uh, site which meant that they actually had to perform cleanup because of the large amount of kerosene fuel that was dumped in the area. They had to you know, ship out hundreds of tons of dirt to be treated. What they do to remove these hydrocarbons is they take it to a facility that will heat it up, the hydrocarbons vaporize, and then they have a high temperature catalyst that breaks it down into carbon dioxide. And we know about this because there were official reports that had to be filed to document this. So anyway, while these vehicles didn't fly as far as expected, their website does claim that these launches were both successful. And honestly, I'm hoping that they will be successful in the next one. They think they've learned from these failures and they will have a pretty good chance of putting this next launch into space. And it's actually been quite an interesting turnaround. They've gone from complete stealth, you know, hiding everything, there's now a lot of stuff out there. The DARPA launch challenge is having videos posted every day. The CEO, Chris Kemp, has said on Twitter that they're working on a live stream for the launch. They've invited my buddy, John Kraus, professional rocket photographer, who I'm sure will make these things look as amazing as they can be. So I guess we're going to see what happens you know, much more publicly than before. Now, looking beyond this launch challenge, the videos that we've seen, they show many, many rockets already in production, multiple units that are getting are near to flight ready. So they are actually churning these things out at quite a rate. According to the CEO, they have maybe 16 launches already planned and manifested. And the launch vehicles are supposed to be very, very cheap. And one of the clues to the cost is that in one interview, they talk about the cost of a carbon fiber nose cone on the first vehicle being about a quarter of a million dollars, and that was close to the cost of the entire vehicle. Therefore, it's reasonable to assume that they're not looking at more than a quarter of a million dollars per launch vehicle. And the cost of a dedicated launch would be something like two and a half million dollars, and that would be up to 200 kilograms of payload. They have a website where you can book potential future launches. You know, you can basically put in which orbit you want you know, and uh, what kind of payloads and they'll tell you when that launch opportunity is. So there's actually two classes of orbit that they're offering. They're offering sun synchronous orbit that will be from Kodiak in Alaska. There's a nine degree orbit possibility and that I think is Kwajalein Atoll. And I'm going to say it's a good thing that all that launch hardware is so easy and mobile because those two launch sites are probably the two least accessible launch sites that are run by the US. There's another couple of launch sites that were mentioned, uh, Vandenberg, Wallops and San Nicolas, which you probably never heard of, but apparently it's possible to launch satellites from an island just off the coast of, you know, LA re region south of uh, Vandenberg. But for now, we're hoping for good weather and a good flight. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.